have uh, Chris Manning here, and I think it's going to be a popular talk, uh, given the density in the room. So, uh, so uh, Chris is the Thomas Siebel Professor in Machine Learning, Linguistics, and Computer Science at Stanford. Uh, many of you probably know him as the author of one of the main uh, statistical NLP books, and also for Stanford Core NLP, which is probably the one of the most popular uh, software toolkits for using NLP deep learning. Uh, so he's uh, basically building software. He, he calls himself building software that intelligently process and understand and generate human language material. He's definitely a leader in deep learning for NLP. He's uh, his, his group, his students and him have created a lot of uh, the more seminal pieces of work in this area, including uh, tree recursive neural networks all the way back in 2013, uh, and then the glove embeddings that a lot of you use, uh, some of the best summarization systems, the pointer generator network models, the entailment system, uh, the Stanford NLI corpora, and a lot of neural machine translation work. So uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, he's, he has a very long list of fellowships. So he's an ACM fellow, a AAAI fellow, an ACL fellow, past president of ACL. Uh, and as I said, a uh, lot of us know him from his books and Stanford Core NLP. So very happy to have you here. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Mohit, for that very nice introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming who came. And thanks also to the people who are listening in from um, the other schools, the Duke and so on. Um, yeah, so today what I want to talk about is a new model class that we've been working on, um, which is referred to here as a compositional attention network, and I'll say a bit more about that pretty soon. But for a goal of can we build neural networks that are more good for doing reasoning and inference? And so the, the backdrop is essentially this. So in the last 20 years, there's just been this huge success of machine learning, and in particular in the last five or so years, that's particularly become a huge success of neural networks or deep learning. And so we're now in this situation that for sort of various intuitive learning tasks um, that humans just sort of do without thinking, um, we now have um, neural network systems that just work amazingly well. So that certainly includes things like speech recognition, computer vision for tasks like object recognition, um, various sort of autonomous vehicles, robotics tasks, and then even going to some that are perhaps maybe seen as if they're a little bit higher level, like doing machine translation. And so, but these tasks are sort of things that human beings do instinctively. They're not really tasks that humans think about and reason with very well. So what about if we want to actually look at tasks that involve reasoning? And so that might be things like doing um, reading comprehension from reading books by dealing things with sort of reasoning tests like SAT and GRE tests, um, working out plans, um, sort of things that are more like strategic board games where you sort of do reasoning processes to work out what to do. What, what about those kinds of tasks? And so what this work is about is saying, well, is there a good way in which we could build deep learning systems such that they're designed so that they're good for capturing reasoning from the ground up? So by what that's what I mean is that we want them to be able to model a kind of a transparent multi-step reasoning process as humans do when they think things through or plan out the steps of things or something like that. Um, but we want to do that in a way that sort of still exploits all the strengths of recent work in neural networks. And so we'd still like to have a model that maintains the kind of nice, easy to work with end-to-end -end differentiability of modern neural network systems and scalability to real world problems. Yeah, so um, as Mohit mentioned in his intro, I mean, in the main, I'm a computational linguist, natural language processing person, and that's sort of 90% of what I do. Um, there's actually not going to be very much of that um, in this talk. We, we see a few sentences and a bit goes about it. But really, this is much more uh, trying to sort of say, well, can you do things with neural networks 
sort of for sort of reasoning and inference. And um, the language sort of barely appears in that. But I mean, I think, you know, the bigger picture part of the question there is that if you look at artificial intelligence research over the decades, that when I was young, um, back in the 70s and 80s, that sort of doing knowledge representation, reasoning inference, that was absolutely the heart of artificial intelligence. That's what everyone wanted to do and make progress on. And trying to do machine learning was a sort of a fairly sketchy side field that very few people worked on. And well, now that's completely inverted itself, right? That now machine learning is right at the center and has become so much the center and, um, of artificial intelligence that a lot of the time, especially sort of in the more general media, that machine learning and artificial intelligence are essentially equated as if they're exactly the same thing. And conversely, doing things like knowledge representation and reasoning has become this very marginalized field on the outskirts of artificial intelligence. And I don't think that's because the problems of knowledge representation and reasoning um, went away. It was more that um, it wasn't clear how to make any progress on them, where suddenly it seemed like that there were these exciting new techniques where you could do pattern recognition-like things with machine learning. And so all the people ran over there and worked on those problems. But I kind of think if we're going to make further progress in artificial intelligence, that we actually have to get back to some of these problems of knowledge representation reasoning. And so this is sort of one attempt to start to try and look at that from a neural network's direction. Okay, so here's my talk outline. So the first part, which I'm sort of in the middle of, is from machine learning to machine reasoning. And then I'm going to show you the clever task, which is um, the actual data set and problem that is the only one you're going to get to see today where we try and develop this system. Um, then I'm going to introduce this idea of memory attention composition neural networks, which is trying to design a different class of neural network architecture that's more suited to what I think um, you want to do for machine reasoning, and then show some of the experiments that come off of that. Okay, what is reasoning? Um, so the question of what is reasoning, that's a pretty difficult question. I guess that's the kind of one that lots of philosophers have written about for millennia. Um, but you know, if you, if you want to answer the question of what is reasoning, and the answer you want to come up with is neural networks, um, there was this very influential, though kind of sketchy and programmatic paper that was written by Leon Batu in 2011, where he tried to sort of programmatically lay out um, what was in reasoning and what was important, and a few thoughts about how you might want to go about um, modeling it. And so this is a few of the things that he said. So the first thing that he thought was essentially different about um, reasoning is that you had previously acquired knowledge and then you're sort of m manipulating it and reusing it to answer new questions. And so that's sort of different to the sort of most of the machine learning systems that you can think of. Um, and well, an interesting point um, he makes which I think is actually interesting food for thought, um, is to say, well, there's this whole tradition of reasoning where you jump immediately from reasoning to logic, because that's kind of like the 2,000 years of tra tradition. But you know, you don't necessarily actually have to jump to logic as soon as you start saying the word reasoning. And maybe what you could think of is that but what you need for reasoning is you need to have some kind of algebraically rich way to do inferences. And logics are a form of an algebraically rich system that you could do inferences on. But there's sort of no reason why you can't also do algebraically rich inferences using you know, numbers and vectors and matrices and things like that. And well, then if you could do that, you're then kind of close to what you could do with the kind of simple manipulations that our neural network learning systems do. Um, but how do they need to be um, different from current systems? And so one of the things that he stresses, which sort of goes back to the first bullet, is this idea that you need to be able to do composition. 
so that if you're going to be doing reasoning and inference, you have to sort of have subparts, right? You have lemmas and things like that, and then you put them together and you do build up bigger inferences. And it's the recombinability of these pieces by composition that lets you address new tasks. Okay, so in particular, you know, there are different kinds of reasoning, and so the classic form that you first to learn in logic class is deductive reasoning, where you start off with some premises and you go through some steps and you get to a conclusion. And it doesn't have to be a linear sequence. You can kind of combine them together in a kind of directed acyclic graph kind of a way. And so that you're doing this sort of composing bits of knowledge to come to a conclusion. And what we'd like to do maybe is something more like that. In contrast, sort of most of what you see in machine learning is sort of more like inductive reasoning, that you're generalizing from a correlation between your features and your desired class, and then you're trying to do predictions based on that. And of course, the validity of those predictions isn't guaranteed. Um, so the question then is, well, can we build machine learning systems that reason? Well, you know, if we just sort of take a basic classifier, that just sort of seems like a big correlation engine, that it doesn't actually seem like that's really reasoning, that they sort of, they build up some kind of inductive bias from the training data. Um, and in a way, that's a good thing. It means that they're extremely good at generalizing when the target and training distributions are similar. But on the other hand, most of our machine learning models really do nothing whatsoever to separate apart correlation from causation. Um, they're not very good at learning general principles that are sort of support the kind of one shot or few shot learning. Mm -hmm. And most of them yeah. don't exhibit any form of compositionality, that you're building a classifier <laughs> whose job it is to recommend movies or to give object classes or whatever. It, it doesn't have any natural way to put pieces together into nat novel combinations. Maybe some background audio. Uh, <laughs> there are ghosts in the machine. Um, okay, so, so on one side um, that, you know, there's decades of work on symbolic and formal approaches to deductive reasoning. And, you know, they have some very good properties, um, which include the fact that they're very interpretable. And in particular cases, you know, there are places where SAT solvers are just extremely useful because they're very scalable, large-scale inference systems for doing various kinds of constraint satisfaction and other things. But on the other hand, they seem to have a lot of problems, which has greatly restricted their use. So they're fragile. They often don't scale well to real world problems. Um, that was sort of found a lot in the 80s. And so there's good there, but there's also bad there. And so the question is, well, could we build a machine learning system, which in particular is going to be a fully differentiable end-to-end -end neural network style model, um, but not a classic machine learning system. But on the one hand, we want to harness all the properties of our modern neural network systems, that they robust, generalize well, scale nicely, and all of these things. But on the other hand, we'd like to have a model which likes to solve problems in a sequence of composable inference steps so we can see something that's closer to explicit reasoning. And so therefore, we also have something that's at least a little bit more interpretable than a lot of neural network systems. Okay, that's my intro. So I hope that makes sense up until there as to what the goal is. Okay, so let me um, briefly introduce um, the task that I'm gonna sort of actually use as the task when I show experiments. And so this is a data set called Clever, um, which was built by Justin Johnson, who's a Stanford Vision student, um, but he built it while he was interning at Facebook Fair in New York. Um, and so the idea of Clever was to come up with a, what's called a visual question answering data set, which is meaning that there's a visual scene, and then you're gonna ask a question about it in natural language. But 
have such a data set where you actually uh, relies on having sort of detailed um, compositional language understanding over elementary visual reasoning. So this is the kind of question there is um, in Clever. So there is a purple cube that is behind a metal object. Um, yeah. Um, um, left to a large ball. Well, there's a large ball and it's the left of it. Um, what material is the cube made out of? Now, at that point, you should, might think, oh, I don't know what that's made out of. Um, but it turns out in the clever data set that the objects are deemed to be made out of only two materials. They're either metal or rubber. So if they're not glossy, they're rubber. Um, and so um, that is then the right answer. Um, okay. Um, and so, so this seems... This seemed a data set that was appealing to us as a data set that to sort of do well on it involved kind of doing this sort of stepwise compositional inference of identifying parts and relations and putting together conjunctions, disjunctions, and various things to get the results. And so that seemed a good data set for us to work with. Um, then over here, I'll just note since this sort of turns up as an attribute of the data set. I mean, so this is a completely constructed data set. Um, these figures were not even photographed, right? These were made in Blender, for those of you who um, know or have kids who know this stuff. Um, and for the questions, so actually the questions were, aren't real. These questions, I'll show you some later that are real questions, but these questions aren't real human natural language. These questions were programmatically constructed and the way they were programmatically constructed was they generated these little functional programs here off to the side, um, which is sort of, you could say, is the underlying semantics. And then um, by rule, they were then generating um, these questions in natural language off of it. Okay, so there are, there are some things that are bad about the data set, and I can discuss those maybe later, or you can ask the questions. Um, but there are also some things that are good at the data set. So, you know, we have these 3D images with a few shapes, colors, materials, and sizes. There are highly compositional multi-step questions. That's good for me. Um, there are these tree-structured functional programs that I just showed you one of. And it seems like to get these questions right, there's sort of a variety of reasoning skills you have to understand. You have to sort of understand transitive inferences, comparisons, countings, attributes of things and amounts and things like that. Um, fortunately, we'll get to later, there's also then this clever humans data set where they actually got asked real human beings to ask questions about scenes. And I'll also show you some results about that. Um, so the idea of clever was because it's kind of a controlled environment, it allows sort of thorough analysis of performance based on the questions type and structure. But more specifically, like the answer to why they invented Clever was that there had sort of been somewhat of a crisis in the vision community about earlier um, visual question answering tasks. And the nature of that was that although it was meant to be this good AI task of asking questions about pictures, what had been shown was actually because of sort of very strong biases in the data and the world, that a lot of the time you didn't actually have to understand much or anything of the visual scene in order to be able to answer the question. And so one of, one of the most famous examples of this was when the question asked um, what's covering the ground or what's on the ground, and the answer is always snow. You don't have to look at the picture. Um, it's just it's going to be snow. Um, and um, so, that, so therefore people had sort of shown that although these VQA systems seemed to get the answers right a lot, that they, it didn't really require visual scene understanding and reasoning as you might think it did. And so by construction, the whole idea of these data set was you can't possibly get the answer right unless you're actually understanding what objects are in the scene and how they're represented relative to each other and what the questions mean. Um, there'd been a bunch of existing work 
um, on this clever data set before we started. And so here are sort of the two basic types. So quite a bit of the initial work used neural module networks. And so this included work by Jacob Andreas and Justin Johnson. And so these models are partially differentiable models because you kind of have these modules that you plug together, um, which you use the strong super supervision provided by that um, functional program that I showed you. So they sort of effectively train, they train a model that goes through the natural language and translates it into a functional program. They train this in a supervised way. And then they use a specialized um, module network execution engine to then run this functional program to try and calculate the answer. Um, and so this sort of works, um, but it seems there are kind of quite a lot of problems with it. Part of which is it sort of is a very Baroque custom architecture for a particular data set because you know they really are generating these specialized neural modules specifically for the kind of questions that are in in clever. So you have the counting module and the comparison module and the pick and attribute module and things like that. Um, but then there were some other approaches that came out more recently, including relation nets from DeepMind and Film from the University of Montreal, which are sort of augmented vision models. So you have a large CNN stack like a vision module, and then you add in something to make it better at doing question answering. So for the DeepMind case, they had this specialized relation net layer, which essentially um, inspected every pair of pixels to predict binary relations between those pixels, and then use that to try and do some of the reasoning. And then there was a kind of interesting module that, model then that came out of um, Montreal, which was film, which sort of tried to then um, sort of put these layers in between the convolutional neural network layers, which are kind of like a layer normalization, but they condition how they normalize based on the question and its semantics to try and work out the answer to the question. That one's a bit harder to get a sense of immediately. Okay, so what I then want to sh introduce to you is these ideas of our um, MAC nets, so memory attention composition networks. Okay, so the idea of this is what we want to do is to have a neural network architecture which is general and reusable, you know, at least in theory we're wanting to aim at something that's sort of just a general thinking engine which we might want to be able to use for different kinds of problems, although up until now we still haven't, that's still future work. Um, but that it has some structure in its design so it's good for problem solving and reasoning tasks. And so the way we do that is we're going to say, well, let's suppose this model is going to do a sequence of explicit reasoning steps. And so that it is going through steps of reasoning. And for each of those steps, it's just going to use one cell architecture, which is our memory attention composition cell. And the architecture of that cell we feel is biased in a good way for doing steps of a reasoning operation. So this means that what we end up with is essentially a recurrent neural network, so that we're just using a sequence of a particular cell type to do our inference with. Um, so, but we're hoping that we've kind of got the right kind of cell, which is good for doing reasoning operations and versatile enough that it can do different kinds of reasoning operations as is needed. And then what the argument is that actually, you know, this network can represent something like an arbitrary logical proof because as well as the sequence of just steps going along, we will allow the, um, the neural network model to do what gets referred to as self-attention, which means it can look back at any of the preceding steps of its proof, um, so to speak. Um, and so that will allow it to get a kind of uh, a DAG structured reasoning architecture. And so in some sense it can look a little bit like what you can do in a logical proof. Um, but 
doing it as a neural network, so the whole thing is end-to-end -end differentiable and has all the nice properties of training neural network models. Okay, um, so the model is sequencing together um, these max cells that do one reasoning step. And so what does the max cell have in it? So central to the max cell, we have two recurrent states. So we have a control state that represents the reasoning operation. And well, how we're gonna represent the reasoning operation is it's gonna be an attention-based average of the query, where our query is that textual question. And then we have a memory state, and so the memory state is gonna maintain retrieved information relevant to a query, which we can kind of accumulate and manipulate over steps. And it's gonna actually come from being an attention-based average over a given knowledge base. Where in our particular example here, we don't really have a knowledge base. Our knowledge base is gonna be that image that um, you're looking at to answer the question. So the substantive hypothesis here is that um, most other neural sequence modules, models just have a single vector recurrent state inside them. And although that's been a very powerful model, um, it sort of stands in distinction how most of our computer architectures are designed and developed. That normally in our computer architectures, we have some kind of separation between control and memory. And the hypothesis is maybe we could build a more powerful reasoning engine if we build into the structure of our neural network the same kind of distinction between having control and memory. Okay, so the core of our model is going to be then our MACnet, which is the sequence of Mac cells, and I'm going to go through that more in a few minutes, and you're gonna see the guts and the detail of that. Um, but before I do that, Surrounding the MAC network, um, you still have the sensory level, right? That if our MAC network is gonna be able to do stuff, it has to take in the picture, and it has to be able to take in the question and do something with it. So we have a sort of an input part of the network, and for the input part of the network, we're using sort of very standard off-the-shelf um, neural network components. So for our query is going to be this English language question for Clever, and so we're processing this by um, a bi-LSTM model, which means you're running a neural network LSTM sequence model forward along the sequence of words and backwards along the sequence of words. And these kind of models are used almost everywhere in your natural language processing these days and have proven to be a successful way to model the meaning of a word in context. So as a result of that, we get a, a vector-based representation for the meaning of each word and context. Those are our contextual words. And then we also want to get a meaning for the whole sentence. And the way we get the meaning for the whole sentence is the overall query representation. I guess I misspelled that. Oops. Um, is in the simplest way possible. We take the final states of both the forward and backward um, LSTM model, we concatenate them together to be a bigger real valued vector, and we call that the whole query representation. Okay, then for the knowledge base, and I say knowledge base multiple times because our hope for future work is we could use the same kind of model with something that's really a knowledge base that has sort of different accumulated knowledge and then can then infer over it. But you know, for what we actually present here, um, the knowledge base, um, is just this image um, that's showing the state of the world with these objects and blocks and so on. And so for that, in this work, we're just using a standard image pipeline. Um, so, you know, literally, we're actually using Justin Johnson's image processing pipeline because we're not really computer vision people and it seems too difficult to build our own. Um, and so that's a ResNet 101 residual network style model from the Microsoft people. Um, that runs the CNN stack, um, and then we put on top of that a final two-layer convolutional neural network, and that then gives us sort of this process representation of the image. Okay, so um, this then shows some more detail of our Mac cell and how that works. Okay, so the 
the goal of this is to sort of have a somewhat more constrained system of building the cells of a neural network, where the hope that it's having more constraints acts as this kind of an inductive bias or prior on um, the model that will actually cause it to learn something that's closer to a reasoning operation. So the operation of our Mac cell has three parts. So it has a control unit. So the control unit maintains its own recurrent state. So there, this is sort of a, a vector of dimension D and it calculates a new vector of dimension D for the next time step. And it's going to update it based on stuff it takes out of the English language query. Um, and then the control unit is going to indirectly control what then happens um, with the memory. So for the memory unit, it also has a recurrent state as a vector of real numbers. And it's going to take that, and then it's going to take the control signal, and together they're going to decide how to read more stuff out of the knowledge base, i.e. the picture. And so I'll read something which will give you a new memory. And then the new memory and the preceding memory are going to be able to combine together and the right unit will calculate a new thing to write and you'll write a new memory for each time step. That makes sense up to there. Okay, so the next few slides um, then go through exactly what these things do. And I can go through it more slowly or more quickly, but you know, this sort of virtually gives the equations for the entire model, um, but um, in a sort of a pictorial form. So for the control unit, um, we have these sort of the contextual words from the LSTM, we have the whole query, and we have the previous control state. And so what we're going to do that is first we um, put through a single neural network layer. So we multiply our query vector by a matrix and add a bias um, to get a sort of time step specific representation of the question. Then based on that um, and the control from the previous time step, we are then going to put those through a neural network layer which calculates a new representation. And then, Okay, what is this doing? I'll try to explain it better. Okay, so we take, we have the query go through a neural network layer to get a sort of a time set specific version of the query. Um, that's then going together with our current control state. And so this is going through another neural network layer. And so the end result of that is to sort of work out which parts of the question does it seem like I should pay attention to. And so at that point, the way we're calculating that is we're saying, well, we have these contextual word representations for each word of the question. And so we're going to see how similar they are to the, this calculated representation. And so formally, that's being done by this Hadamard product operation, which is looking at a sort of a form of overlap of the two. And so having calculated that, we then do a bit more than that. We're actually going to say, well, okay, we've calculated something here, and what we want to do is reproject it back onto the words of the question. So we have another neural network layer here where we um, can learn parameters to calculate things. And then at the end here, we use attention back to the words of the question. And so what we're saying is, okay, how we're actually going to represent the control signal is as a weighted mixture of the representations of the words in the question. So we're actually sort of placing attention back onto the words of the question here, um, and then put, calculating a weighted average of those, and that gives us our final control signal. Um, and that part at the end is a little bit subtle, and I can only sort of 
half justify why it's necessary. You could think, okay, well, you've calculated some representation off of the question, the words, that's your control signal, um, just go with that and run with it. But what we found was that by sort of pushing um, what you calculated back onto the words in the question and constructing this weighted average representation of the contextual word representations, that that kind of grounding it back into the question word representations proved to work effectively as a way to promote learning and a kind of regularization, and we could get better results by doing that. Do you want to? No? What's that? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's the read unit, and I can scare you again. The right unit's the simplest one, so I guess the easier ones we get to there. Um, okay, so for the read unit, um, we have a previous memory, and we have the knowledge base that's the picture, and that's what we have to work with. So what, what are we going to do? Um, so we're first of all going to work out some idea of what to look at um, in our picture. And so we're going to take the whole picture and our previous memory state, we're going to put both of those through a layer of a neural network, and again, we're going to use this Hadamard product operation to say um, what parts of the picture representation are similar to our previously stored memory operation. And so we're going to use that calculated representation to then say, okay, we're going to then be able to use that to get further evidence as to where to look in the knowledge base. So we take that calculation and combine it again with the knowledge base, rep the representation of the picture, and put it through a neural network layer. And then at that point, we also then combine in our control signal, because it's wanting to tell us what things that we should be paying attention to. So that's another um, Hadamard product operation to say, well, what things are similar to the control, um, and that goes through another neural network layer, and then again, having done that, we've eventually worked out something which we're going to use to get information out of our knowledge base, and so we again are then calculating a, a visual attention over the knowledge base or over the image, and so then we're forming a weighted average of where to look in the image, and that gives us our new memory representation. So the, this is sort of a complex multi-stage operation, but there sort of were some ideas as to what was going on here. So, you know, we wanted to have the previous memory influencing how we use our knowledge base. We want to have the control signal influencing how we use the knowledge base. And we want to allow sort of different kinds of interaction because sometimes you want to be able to combine multiple memories together before you pay attention um, to the knowledge base. And sometimes you just want to directly get something from the knowledge base. And we can kind of control that with our control structure. And we get a new memory. And again, we employ the same idea that at the end of the day, our, mem our new memory is just constructed as an attention distribution over our visual scene. And so it's, again, just like the language grounded in the visual scene. Okay, so then for the, the right unit cell, um, it's then going to sort of decide something that can be written as the new memory. So the read unit um, calculated a new retrieval, which is sort of a candidate new memory, and we have the previous memory. And so the simplest form of having a right unit would just be to say, okay, let's take these two things, put them through a single neural network layer, and write it out, and that's our new memory for the next time step. And it actually turns out that at least for this um, clever data set, if you simply do that and nothing more, that that actually already works pretty well, and you've just got this simple combination. But for the general model we had in mind, doing a bit more than that. Um, and so 
we have a more complex model that in principle seems like it should be better, um, but in practice, it only helps a bit for our current model. So that we're doing this multi-step inference process along this sequence model, and well, the model that we use just has a fixed sequence length, right? We're gonna run these problems on a sequence of length 12 and try and answer the questions. Now it sort of intuitively seems that some of the questions are very simple and should only take five reasoning steps, and some of them are harder and might take 10 or 12 reasoning steps. So it seems like at some point you might want to stop. And so an obvious way in which you can stop is putting in a highway gate so that the control can determine to what extent you use the new memory versus you just carry along the previous memory without changing it. And so the idea is the model should be able to learn that after four steps it's finished its reading process, and then for the next eight steps, it just sort of copies across the previous memory and does no more inferencing because there's nothing else to do. Um, and then I've mentioned a couple of times that, well, we sort of thought we could simulate a logical proof which has more of a DAG-like tree structure by saying, well, we, we're not only going to combine the previous step's memory and the current memory together to create a new memory, when we're doing this, we should actually allow self-attention to previous states in the memory so that we'll allow ourselves to look back at any of the previous memories and combine them together as well. And so we can put this kind of self-attention module into the sequence of memories and hope that that will improve things as well. Okay, um, so then the result of this is, so this is our max cell. And so to make a mat network, we're gonna just take a sequence of P of these max cells for where for the work I show you, we just choose a fixed length and we say it's eight or it's 12 or whatever and run the model. And so then this gives us our reasoning architecture. So it's just this sort of simple uniform sequential structure for all queries and it's still a kind of an efficient model that's fully differentiable. Um, but our hope is that by using this self-attention, we can model arbitrarily complex um, DAG-style reasoning. And the very final thing we have to do is we have to be able to answer questions. And so we also have an output unit. And so the way we construct the output is we take the original query and the final memory, and then we're gonna predict an answer. Now for clever, the answers are trivial that you can just do it with a single classifier over a vocabulary of size 28, because there are actually only 28 possible answers. And you might at first wonder how can the number be so small, but it's a very restricted scene. So there are only two object materials, remember, metal, rubber, um, there are only four colors, um, there are yes, no questions, there's sort of bigger, smaller, um, and there are, there are numeric questions, so there are sort of how many cubes are there in the picture or to the right of the yellow block, but you know, there are never that many things in the picture, so we only need single digit numbers. Um, so at the end of the day, there are actually 28 different possible answers to questions. So we're just using a simple softmax classifier um, that picks um, the final word. Um, the one little subtlety here is this final classifier does get two inputs. It gets the query representation, Q, and the final memory. And you might think, well, wait, hasn't the memory calculated things? Can't we just feed the memory into this final classifier and that's sufficient to answer it? Um, but that's not the case, and that sort of makes sense given this design that we've come up with. So in particular, um, the query is never directly fed into um, the memory, that the query gets fed into the control, and the control sort of determines how the read and write units act. It tells it sort of where to look in the knowledge base, but it never actually gets itself fed into the memory. And you can, we could argue about whether that's a defect or not of the current design, but it does effectively mean that the memory doesn't directly contain the contents of the query, and so it is necessary for good performance to sort of put the query into the final classifier. Okay, um, with a 
stop for a breath there at that point. I'll now tell you something about how this has actually worked out. Okay, so there was this clever task, if you remember, and so most precisely, um, so they generated 700,000 training examples where, you know, they sort of randomly generated these scenes, excluded them if the occlusion was too bad, objects weren't visible at all, um, similarly constructed a test set, um, answer vocabulary, and so this was the data set. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of the construction method involves these functional programs which provide a kind of a strong supervision because they give you a kind of a semantics and the sort of semantic parsing like sense um, for um, the questions. And so one of the parameters of variation on other methods is whether they use the strong supervision of the functional programs or whether they don't. And as I, as hopefully you noticed, our model doesn't use the functional programs whatsoever. It just uses the sentence of text and the picture. So, um, so in the original paper that presented the data set, um, these were the results that they presented. So the baseline um, means that you give the most frequent answer for each question type, and that's actually already very high because you get 41% right. Why is it so high? Well, if the question is about what material, there are only two materials, and if the question is yes, no, there's yes and no, right? So there are actually lots of questions that only have two possible answers, and so that provided you can get the question, you're doing the prior per question type, not over the entire set of answers, you can get almost 42% already. Um, they first of all tried um, the type of uh, methods that were common in the VQA community of sort of LSTM over the language, CNN stack over um, the image, um, put both of those into some kind of classifier to choose the answer. And that didn't work very well at all. That only got to about 52%. So this seemed to them that there was, um, this was successful in having created a hard data set um, that required reasoning. Um, Actually, the next result isn't from the Justin Johnson paper, so this, the next result is Jacob Andreas's work. So Jacob Andreas and colleagues at Berkeley started working at um, produce, using their neural modular network for this data set, um, and their first result on that did quite a lot better and got 83.7%, so that looked kind of promising. And then from the original paper, they'd gotten human beings um, to uh, try and answer these questions, and they got 92.6%. Um, and so this looks like we're kind of in the space of how things commonly are with these neural net data sets and so on. Um, but, I mean, you might be suspicious as to why the humans only got 92.6%, because it seems like these are questions you should be able to get right. Um, because they were artificially constructed. And I can actually talk more about that later. Um, but um, sort of effectively, um, as things moved on from the first year to the second and third year of the existence of this data set, um, all the action moved into this top region of the zone above the so-called human performance. Because given the constructed nature of the data set, you actually should be able to get 100%. There isn't any source of anything that means you shouldn't be able to get 100%. So in particular, um, DeepMind examined their relation networks, and so they got to 95.4%, um, supposedly above the humans. Um, then um, Justin Johnson did a, a better and more sophisticated version of neural module networks and it got 96.9%. And then most recently before us, um, the Montreal film model that I um, briefly mentioned, um, it got 97.7%. Um, and so effectively, all of the neural module network works are strongly supervised and sort of use the functional programs, where actually neither the relation networks or film did, and neither do we. Do we. Okay. Um, so You'll be pleased to know, but perhaps expecting, that our number does it, model does even better than this um, and gets 98.9%, 90, which sort of more than halves 
the remaining error, and that's kind of sweet. Um, but you could also be suspicious that by the time we're up around 97, 98, 99%, is, are these differences so significant? So I actually think there are some more interesting results that I'll get to in just a minute. Um, so since there are different types of questions, you can look at accuracy per type. So there are sort of existence questions. Is there a green block to the right of the yellow block? There are query um, questions. They're comparing attributes. Are these two, is the yellow cube and the green sphere made of the same material? And in some sense, previously up until now, the hardest questions for various systems had been comparing numbers. So this is something like, are there more cubes than there are orange spheres? And counting, so how many um, spheres are behind the um, orange cube? And in particular, the hardest kind of question previously had been these counting questions, which um, several of those previous models were only getting about 90% on, and you're seeing definite progress on the more recent models. But in terms of thinking there's something interesting in what we've designed for our magnets, I think actually the most interesting evidence is evidence that what we've built is actually a much better learning device because it sort of has a kind of inductive bias that encourages it to learn much more effectively. And so one piece of evidence about this is that our model learns much more quickly. So the sort of the CNN plus LSTM kind of models, which aren't really very designed for the problem at all, learn very slowly over epochs. So each epoch is seeing all 700,000 um, examples in the training data. So this is, we're up to 7 million training examples. Um, whereas MACnet sort of learns way more efficiently than any of these other models. So essentially by the time it's gotten up to two epochs that it's also doing, already doing extremely well. Um, um, the relational network is especially, especially slow, but I can't actually show it in this graph because there's not enough data in the DeepMind paper and there isn't a public implementation available. Um, here's another graph that I think is sort of even more interesting. So this is a classic learning curve where we're now training the model on some subset of the data from sort of all 700,000 training examples, 350, a quarter of the data, and then going down to sort of 10, 5, 2, 1 percent of the data. And so what you see here as well is that most of the, most of the models, including models that have done very well, such as the film model, which is being shown in red there, that they do do well, but they only do well if they're shown a lot of the data. So the fill model is starting to do well once it's been trained on 350,000 training examples. But it's not doing at all well if it's trained on the quarter of the data, 175K training examples. I mean, in particular, remember again up that the baseline is this 41.8%. And so that means trained on 175,000 examples, it's not actually doing all that much better than the baseline. So in contrast, um, the MAC model sort of learns to generalize from small amounts of data actually very effectively. So for the MAC model, if you're giving it just 10% of the data, 70,000 examples to train on, well, it's already getting to 86%, which is actually pretty decent, whereas all of these models uh, sort of around 50%, again, not much over this 40% um, of the data. So that's kind of a nice result. Okay, um, so all of those questions were constructed, so you might then also wonder about uh, what happens when there are real questions. So there's this second data set of clever humans where they collected 18,000 real questions through crowdsourcing. The humans were essentially told to write questions that would be hard for a smart robot to answer about the scene. And they had to be, quest the questions still had to have as their answer one of those 28 words, um, but they could be arbitrary questions with whatever vocabulary and linguistic variation and reasoning skills the person wanted to use. Um, and so here are the results from that. So one thing you, so since there's, 
since there's only a very small data set, people are sort of regarded as not really practical to directly train on this data and, um, and because there just wasn't enough training data because it's using a subset of this data. So the first thing you could do is just take your trained um, model from the clever data and run it and see how many you get right and that's that. But then what people have done is sort of taking half of this data as a sort of a training set for adaptation and then testing on the other half. Um, and so that then gives you a sort of a fine-tuned result. Um, and the, well, again, we win. Um, but again, um, the sort of good result is it seems like our model is being able to gain more by fine tuning, right? So this model's only gaining about 6% from fine tuning. This one's getting about 12. The film is starting to do rather better by fine tuning, but we're doing more better again in terms of our gains from fine tuning, which again, I think kind of that shows um, that it's a useful model structure. Um, the, the claim was then that sort of by the nature of the model, it sort of composes these elementary reasoning steps, and it's, so it will have a kind of interpretability. And the sense in which that's true is, if you remember, that both the control unit was represented as a tension distribution over words, and the read unit was represented as a tension distribution over the knowledge base, the visual scene. And that means that each step in the reasoning, um, we can sort of show what it's looking at, and that gives a kind of interpretability. Now, if I'm perfectly honest, I think, you know, these looking at attention, interpretability of neural networks is a kind of interpretability, and you also want to hold on to your wallet because you can sort of tell just those stories about the, any of any of attention in models. But it's kind of interesting what you see it doing. So what I'm showing here is output, for examples, where um, the length of the MACnet is six. Um, that's because it makes them slightly more visible on the slide. Um, the best results, the best results we get are by using a longer sequence. So the, ex the experimental results I provide up until now, we're using a reasoning sequence of 12. Um, but that sort of makes it a bit long and hard to show the slide story. And both of these are examples of counting, which is since they're the most difficult class. So how many objects are either small objects behind the teeny metal cylinder or metallic cubes in front of the large green metal sheet, metal object, sorry. Um, and so it does seem like in general, you can sort of see it dealing with parts and putting things together. So at the first step, it's putting attention on many um, and small. And so I can less explain the small, but you know, it's getting saying, okay, I've got a counting question. Let's work with a counting question. Then it puts attention on or, okay, there are two conditions. So it's sort of figuring out something to look at there. Um, so then at the third time step, it's sort of the green metal object, and you can see the visual attention is then very clearly looking at green metal object. Um, then it's for the fourth step, it's sort of saying metallic cubes, and the attention is again here in the metallic cubes. Um, and then in the fifth time step, this part saying behind the teeny metal cylinder, and it does focus in on the teeny metal cylinder. Um, and then here at the last time set, it's sort of saying, or small objects, and it's sort of focusing in on the small objects. And um, somehow or the other, um, at the end of doing that, it's managed to correctly determine that the answer is four. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's one more example of this. So this one is, how many objects are balls behind the big brown object, or blue matte balls behind the cyan? Um, mat ball. And again, so it starts off with the many and balls. There's a certain consistency of strategy, the or, and then it's sort of looking at the second part, the cyan mat balls, and you can see it sort of focuses in on the cyan mat balls. Um, and then it's sort of um, doing the brown or blue, and then it's sort of, it's 
writing is he wants to know about balls and is counting them and getting an answer of four. Um, in the paper, there are many more examples where you can stare at those attention maps and see what you can figure from them. Yes? Um, so I agree. I'm not sure I have anything very wise to say about that. I mean, the parts of the parts of attention that it seems that you can really see, the easiest things to make sense of are when it focuses on an description of an object or object class in the language, and you can see it also focused on the vision. Um, but you clearly also see it focusing on words that indicate question type and indicate logical structure like the or, you don't seem to see the same kind of strong attention on the operators. But somehow it seems to get enough meaning out of the operators that's still able to answer the questions nearly all the time. And I'm not sure I actually have something very wise to say about that. But yeah, good question. Okay. So I'm just about done, which is probably good time-wise. I'm not sure I'd ask me to stop speaking by. Um, okay, so, um, so just to say a couple of remarks about how these models differ from other models. So, so for Mac nets versus the kind of um, module nets, I mean, we kind of believe that the Mac net architecture is a sort of a more useful generic architecture for doing reasoning. So that we've got a single cell type that is just used everywhere, but is sort of versatile in its design, so it can do different kinds of reasoning operation. On the other hand, like any recurrent network, it also sort of shares architecture and parameters across the sequence. And that, whereas in a module network, there's no sharing whatever. Each module in the module collection has completely separate parameters that have nothing to do with each other. And this sharing of parameters actually really seems to help. So we did some separate sort of ablation model variance studies and we did a, um, a version where you sort of had separate max cells at each time step without parameter sharing and that worked decidedly worse. Um, right, so it can continuously adapt in a neural network style its behavior in the context in which it's applied. Um, and maybe I've sort of said the inverse of this already, um, but the module networks aren't end-to-end -end differentiable continuous modules that you can just optimize in a neural network fa fashion because you have this sort of discrete fixed inventory of modules and they're sort of specialized to each particular task and their parameters optimized separately. Um, if you compare MacNets and um, then some of the other modules, so for the relation networks, I mean, I think relation networks fundamentally work at the wrong level because their binary relations are at the pixel level. And I kind of think if you want to be doing any kind of high level inference, you want to be doing relations at the level of objects which you're dealing with and representing, not relations between pixels. Um, for the film model, I mean, in some ways the film model um, was an, even a bit of inspiration for our model because it also captures this idea that queries and images are separate and they're not transformed into the same vector space for a final classification decision and that the um, query is used to sort of as a mediating um, source of information. But in film, the question affects the computation over the entire image by sort of applying this sort of global conditional normalization layer to a CNN pipeline. Um, you know, if I'm honest, I don't quite understand how um, a, the film network works as well as it does. Because it seems to me that, right, in the film network, you're sort of, you've got this kind of normalization layer which you're setting the parameters of based on the question, but then you apply it over the entirety of the image. So there's sort of no localization to parts of the image. So it's sort of 
somehow surprises me it works as well as it does, but in practice it seems to work reasonably um, well. So in contrast, it seems like the MACnet does have good compositional reading, reasoning skills. And it does better at aggregation and counting, um, and especially good, it does sort of effective generalization from small amounts of data. Um, and as a result of that, you can say that it learns faster and by an order of magnitude. And I kind of think that these sort of factors for what we have at the moment are actually the most convincing factors for saying um, that this is actually a better network as a sort of a learner for doing inference problems. Um, there's a one more slide of claims which I'll maybe skip. Um, but anyway, this is joint to work with Drew Hudson. Um, this is going to be a paper that appears at iClear 2018. And if you want to learn more about it, um, you can look it up on the web already. Thank you. Yeah, question? Well, we're... We're randomly selecting, but yeah, okay. You know, there actually were. Um, <laughs> that's a good. Um, so, right. So, so, yeah. So, there actually are error bars here on the lines. Um, and what you'll see is the film model, there's actually quite a bit of variation in its performance. And so here are uh, my error bars. Where actually, for our model, you can just see a teeny bit there, right? But there's actually extremely, extremely small variation in its performance. Andrew? Um, so, speculation, but I mean, there's, there's been a lot of, so if a simple form of a knowledge base is sort of a triple store, right, and so that's anything like the kind of RDF knowledge bases that have been used, there's been a whole heap of work at encoding subject, predicate object, triple stores into neural network um, representation space, and so I'd imagine that effectively we're going to use something like that and say, okay, we can represent this set of triples in vectors, build it in as our knowledge base, and then be choosing to look at them. Oh, sorry, I forgot to ask the remote sites. Uh, any questions from Duke or NC State? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll continue here. I think Tong and then Mark. Well, no, it's learning it. So th it fed into the, it fed, the control signal fed into that highway. So when we had the highway gate, the control signal fed into the highway gate. So for different questions, it could be deciding to do so produce a sequence of different lengths. Um, yeah. uh, I think you could decide to, I think you, you could explicitly output an, um, an N token. I mean, in some sense, I'm not sure if that's fundamentally different or it's sort of a different way of encoding the same option.
Um, so, I mean, really up until now, we sort of haven't experimented with that. And so, yeah, again, I guess I think I, I can only give a speculative answer. But yeah, I mean, the, the control unit never looks at the memory or the image, right? So whatever, we could argue about whether this is perfect or not, but whatever it's building is completely um, independent of our knowledge base or image or whatever it is. And so therefore, um, well, actually that's not quite true. Since the control line feeds down, you are when you back propagating, feeding back stuff back into it. So maybe that, I, maybe I have to slightly take back that sentence. Um, but yeah, I, it seems like it's pretty independent of the image or knowledge base. So I think it should be the case that this could then be just reused for other tasks and it should work pretty well. But yeah, that's again speculative. Maybe one last question. Oh, oh. oh you can ask I thought you as well. Yeah. I guess in origins, it's more of a hunch. Yeah, there isn't any formal proof. I mean, in practice, I mean, so yeah, there's sort of a bit of a rhetorical argument that having this reprojection back down onto the sort of the, I'll start again. I mean, I think on the hunch, I, I think sort of why we did it was we're sort of, um, interest in this idea of interpretability and having a model that's more observable as to what it did. So I think really the reason we first explored it was, oh, we want to try and build a more interpretable more model. Therefore, if we represent um, the output of the control unit as an attention distribution over the words, that will give us an easy interpretability because we'll be able to show what the the control unit is asking for by simply looking at the attention weights of the model. So that was kind of why we first did it. Um, but comparing not having that versus having that, we found that this sort of projection back onto the words actually, you know, very significantly makes them the model better, right? If we rip that back out again, we lose several percent of performance. And so it seemed to us like this projection back on the words was a somehow an effective form of regularization or st structuring of what the model did and caused it to work a lot better. So let me take that, your question offline. So let's thank the speaker again. Yeah.